Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to reInvent HR Orange County uh, for our next uh, chapter in this series, long running series that we've had in Orange County and other locations around the globe. Uh, we've got quite an exciting session for you this morning. Uh, Dr. Nia, I'm just going to have you wave at me so you can hear me okay. Great, excellent. Uh, well, we've got, again, a very exciting show for you this morning. Uh, many of you have the um, have been sent this morning the bios again. And also, uh, in the event you don't have the bios, if you go to our website and go to the July 16th page, you'll see a download, downloadable version of all the bios of our speakers this morning and their topics. So let's get after it. Um, it's a, uh, again, we've got a pretty full agenda here of spark talks designed to inspire and energize you. And these really are spark talks each one of these speakers this morning is a noted keynoter in their own right. Any one of these people could carry this entire session and more, and we've asked them to do the impossible, to inspire you and energize you in a manner of eight minutes or less, um, with eight or less slides. So a uh, huge challenge for these presenters, but they brought their best material today, and I know you'll agree with me. Also, Use the Q&A function and or the chat function on your, um, your screen here this morning. Be sure to use the Q&A. We will be addressing all of your questions as we go through the session this morning. All right, this is the host and creator of this entire series. Many of the people uh, that are talking this morning as well as others that are viewing today uh, are part of this Executive Next Practice Institute. It's based at the University of California, Irvine. We've been around for 11 years and putting together C-suite executives in groups of 100 to 1,000 to look at emerging concepts, potentially transformative strategies, and we look at first look trends. So much of the material today you see will have not been seen anywhere before, and that's why we're excited to present it to you. At the end of the day, what we're after here is to develop for you practical, what we call next practices development for you and your organization. That's what this is all about. Again, our home base is University of California, Irvine, Beale Applied Innovation. There is a picture of one of our events back in March before the shutdown. We hope to get back to in-person events soon. In the meantime, we are fully virtual on a global basis and you'll see a lot of content. Uh, feel free to scan that QR code. Uh, by the way, you'll get the presentation later, but uh, Scan us, bookmark us. We'll look forward to seeing you at all of our events across the country. We touch on all topics, HR, C-suite, financial, marketing, um, all designed to help you and your leadership's teams stay ahead of the curve. Now, we also partner with multiple organizations across the country. Uh, one of our favorite partners here in Southern California is Pyra. Uh, Ron Herrera, I think you uh, are able to chime in here. I think we've got you uh, where you can speak this morning. Let's see if we can pull Ron in here. Ron, you're enabled. I'm not sure if you have your audio on or not. Maybe he's accidentally muted. Sometimes we yeah, do. You may have, sometimes you may have accidentally muted yourself. Let's uh, yeah. one moment. Let's see if we can get you in here, Ron. Just one second. You might check your. Uh, All right, Ron, can we hear from you? Looks like we got some audio difficulty. One of the beauties of technology. So I'll speak for Ron this morning. Uh, again, these are long-term partners of ours. Ron is chair of uh, Pyra in, uh, in Orange County, and uh, we're delighted to have them as well as the entire Pyra organization. The one thing we do want to let you know about that's coming up with Pyra is their annual conference in, in October uh, please register today. This is a special rate, and the new flex rate is in available uh, until August 31st. Now, this is a, uh, I've spoken at this conference many times before. It is uh, the Seminole event in, the, in Southern California. Please bookmark this as well, and we're going to look forward to seeing you there at Pyra. Again, we'll send you all this information following this session today so you don't miss it. Uh, also, August 27th, we have a special live stream forum coming up with Tech Coast Angels. 
and many other major organizations emanating right here from UCI Beal Applied Innovation on entrepreneurship and uh, entrepreneurship, how we create jobs and grow out of this current uh, series of crises. Be sure to sign up for that. That's on our website. I also want to thank our annual sponsors. Without these folks, we would not exist. And they have all stepped up to the plate. Uh, they support all these events. Dale Carnegie, Epic, thank you. Uh, I know Mark is on the line along with Sean. Thanks, Epic, for being here. Technosis, Fragman has joined us on a um, global basis. And uh, Miller Farm Media, our tremendous uh, media partner who helps us put these shows on. We also want to thank this morning, uh, Ascentus. And Ascentus comes in on a number of these events across the globe. And um, if you don't know who Ascentus is, they're a human capital management company that's been providing a la carte HR software, including HR, payroll, time, talent, and recruiting to organizations for over 30 years. Uh, they're providing some very timely support to you and uh, to their clients in this time of COVID-19. They help organizations prove their HR and payroll functions with leading workforce management solutions. They're supported by an ongoing committed commitment to delivering unsurpassed client-centric service. And their software integrates with your current software and processes so you don't have to disrupt what's already happening. So it's fully integrated. Whether you use one tool or a full suite, their software comes with a dedicated team that provides and supports you uh, through the implement, implementation and beyond. There's no question that COVID-19 has shifted the definition of a safe workplace. In response, Ascentus has launched CarePoint, a first-to-market touchless clock solution that helps employers get back up to speed while protecting the well-being of employers. Um, go to their website, ascentus.com, for more information. Again, thank you for Ascentus for stepping up the plate for this session this morning. And we have one of their representatives, Monica, with us this morning, Monica Lloyd. You'll see, hear from her in a few minutes. Uh, finally, our in-house strategy advisory team has also supporting this event today. Next Work Strategy does just what it says. They create virtual strategic offsites for your organization. They create on innovation programs to train your workforce. And finally, they align that workforce via a very unique visual tool called Immerse Maps. All right, where are we? Uh, here we are, July 16th, uh, which many of us look at as like our new January 1st, uh, and rightly so, it's all a whole new world. Uh, both from a market dynamic, as well as from a social standpoint, things are changing. Uh, if you look at organizations, certainly in the public sphere, statues are coming down, but what statues need to come down in your own organization? long-standing legacy policies, practices, and behaviors that have no time and place in today's workforce. So again, uh, this is a time of tremendous reflection and opportunity, and that's the way we look at it as we go forward here. So are you barely hanging on, or are you looking at this as an opportunity to grow? Hopefully you're looking at the second part of this, and that's what we're here to provide you today. So I want to welcome our stellar speakers this morning. And uh, uh, our moderator today, I, we're just delighted to have Dr. Anit Polite, excuse me, Dr. Anit Polite Wilson with us today. She's known as Dr. Anita. She's the founder and CEO of Anita Enterprises Incorporated. She helps leaders and teams in high stress situations successfully navigate complexity and change together. Uh, She's been working with leaders for more than 20 years, shifting the paradigm of change management activities from check the box initiatives that have little or no real impact to change the culture behaviors that will noticeably improve organizations. Dr. Anita de defines client success as aligning people, passion, and purpose. And I think that, again, that's perfect for the day. Dr. Anita is not just a moderator today, but I've asked Dr. Wilson to uh, share her perspectives after each set of speaker each set of speakers come on to give us her reflections and then also uh, work us through your q a as we go through this this morning welcome dr wilson thank you so much scott i'm always so honored to have the opportunity to work with you 
And before we let you go, I want to acknowledge your amazing leadership in producing this event. Your vision is absolutely unmatched. COVID came through and you just rolled with the punches. So thank you for always role modeling leadership. We appreciate you so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marina. We've got a great team behind us that you're right. They pivoted day two of the shutdown to a, a virtual situation. So what I'm going to do while uh, you're teeing up Victor here is um, make uh, Victor our host and have him start off from there. All right. Good morning, everyone. Our first guest is Mr. Victor Assad, the CEO of Victor Assad Strategic HR Consulting, managing partner of Innovation One and sales advisor to Me Be Bought. I love that name. He works with companies to transform HR, conduct executive and technical search, implement remote work and improve leaders, teams and cultures of innovation. And today he's going to share with us three robust strategies to crush today's crisis. Victor, welcome. Dr. Anita, thank you very much. And uh, Scott, thank you for bringing us all together. Very much appreciate that. And uh, so hopefully everyone can see my screen here. And uh, I'm going to start talking about the three robust strategies to crush today's crises. You know, we have, we have crises with COVID-19, a severe recession, and deep divided politics and and we are divided racially, and all this is too bad, but we have strategies to overcome this, and HR has the empirical research and the predictive models to do it. And later, as you'll see, we have digital technology that'll help us crush it. Let's talk about these three strategies. The first one is to redefine the now office with a robust use of remote work. The second one is to nurture inclusive, collaborative, and agile cultures of innovation, we need that to grow and to move forward. And the final one of the three is to empower digital transformation across the whole talent management platform. And we need to do this from recruiting to performance management to succession planning throughout the whole platform. And I'll tell you something, with artificial intelligence, we can do this without bias. Some of you may react negatively, but I'll tell you how. Let's go with the first one, redefining the office of the future. COVID-19 shattered the office, but not the workers. Look at this, 70% of remote workers and about 70% of their leaders say that they are as productive or more productive than before COVID-19. This was a great transition to working remotely. People often run in home in an afternoon with their laptop and files and 50% of them want to con continue to work from home after COVID-19 abates. But the real question is, how do we do this? How do we define the now office? And a recent survey by Gallup shows our progress has stalled because of our national division politically. It is time for leaders and companies to lead. And I'll tell you, the early investor, the early mover with this now office, <coughs> is going to be the winner. They're going to be the most profitable and the most successful moving forward. What does that look like? I'm gonna give you a new paradigm to think about. The paradigm is to provide the space, time, and technology for where, when, and how employees work. And most of the time, it will not be nine to five and in an office. It's gonna depend on what they need in their jobs and what their teams need. I was fortunate working with Medtronic as an HR leader in Santa Rosa, California, way back in 2012, before we had COVID-19, to use this paradigm to launch a flexible work environment and remote work. We had great success. 45% of our workforce, we determined could work remotely three to four days a week. They did most of their work through, the techno through their um, computers, digital technology, technology, texting, phone calls, video conferencing works, worked for them. What we did have to do is train our teams, whether they had full remote workers or shared remote and in the office, on new operating norms, where to find the, the files that they needed, how to use the new technology, how to communicate and interact with each other. We had to really work with leaders about being empowering about being inclusive and helping people through the change to work remotely, but we had great success with that. And we heavily invested in digital technology, not just Zoom, but a lot of the back office stuff, uh, file share, share, 
file servers and um, cybersecurity, that type of thing. Look at the results, 22% and productivity increase with remote workers, better work-life integration. And we actually had to train people on that too, because without the commute in the morning and the afternoon, they began to work too much and get stressed out. We had to show them that it was okay to ask for downtime every day and how to do that. It improved our recruiting, our retention, and reduced carbon emissions. The workforce loved it. Very successful. Let's move on to the second strategy, and that is to nurture innovation. Without innovation, our workforces cannot adapt quickly to all these changes hitting us, and they're hitting us for the first time. Many people in, in HR don't believe that innovation and culture can be measured. And of course, what you can measure, you can manage, and what you can manage, you can improve upon. We have the research that shows that, and um, culture management is in our bailiwick. This is in our wheelhouse in HR. We all need to be great at this. Looking to the right, you see the Innovation Health Index from Innovation One, developed by my colleague, Dr. Brooke Dobney. It outlines the four organizational uh, dimensions you need for innovation and the 12 drivers of innovation. We tell our clients about the six traits of innovation. Here's what they are. They're on your screen. Leaders make innovation a strategic imperative. They change their strategic planning. They tell everyone about their, their strategies to be innovative. They communicate it all the time and they ask for help. They unleash creativ creativity by their employees. And that's a huge issue for management. That's a huge issue in changing management so it's more empowering. They have processes to move ideas forward. My friends in HR, you, we change our perform, performance management systems to support and encourage innovation and the competencies you need for that. We go out and hire people that have those competencies and the new and diverse skill sets we need. We put in place knowledge management systems to support it. And of course, we invest in it. And the most important investment is organizational learning. What learned and what failed? Uh, in addition to the time and the space and the skills training, and of course, the digitization. I'm going to tell you what our research says about inclusion. Innovation doesn't happen without inclusion. It's dead. You need inclusion. Inclusion doesn't happen without executives valuing it and living it. If they don't value it, Everyone knows it's fake. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the 12 drivers of innovation, you see employee creativity circled there. That's where we measure how people feel uh, included. But the biggest thing is, does each worker feel they have a voice and does their manager recognize their talents and ability? That's the gold standard. That's what we have to work towards. And when you have that, you're going to have inclusion. You're going to hear more of that from three other presenters today, and I'm looking forward to that. The final thing I want to talk about, the final three here, is empowering the digital transformation across our platforms and talent management. And I'm going to have you close your eyes, everybody. You too, Scott. Close your eyes. Imagine that you can screen in hours and find the talent you need. Get 200, 200 people and without bias because you don't see their names. The computer is only screening them on the competencies you put into that. You can do that with artificial intelligence. But I'll tell you, avoid the bad artificial intelligence, which is facial recognition technology. Imagine for a second again that 90% of the people you reject for your jobs had such a great experience, they recommend your company to others. Go apply here. You can do that with chats. Imagine for a minute that the top 20 questions that come into HR, IT, operations, Salesforce are answered by chats. You can do that with intelligent digital assistance. And Scott, I'm at the end of the time. Those are the three strategies. And um, thank you for the time. And I'm going to endeavor to give this back to you. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Great job, Victor. And uh, Dr. Anita, I'll let you uh, take over and bridge us over to Monica Lloyd. I will do that. Victor, thank you so much for sharing. The thing that hit me in the face the most was when you said um, the new paradigm, space, time, and tech for where when and how people work. Amazing. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Next up is Ms. Monica Lloyd. She currently serves as a pre-sales manager and sales trainer at Ascentis. Monica has over 25 years as an HR practitioner, 
from recruiter, generalist, compensation manager, trainer, manager and director, and VP of HR. Today, Monica is going to explain to us how to prepare for the new normal, things employers should start considering now. Monica, take it away. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Um, right now, we're going to talk about the, f the for now normal. I know we've been talking about the new normal. And I actually changed the name because I liked it so much. Some news outlets are calling 2020 the lost year. But for C-suites and professionals and uh, people working from home, we have a different narrative, right? Our work has just gotten started. So today, we're going to let 90s TV shows show us a path of how to get through this and show us the way forward for the for now normal, which is what we're doing right now is the present moment, right? It's willing to change. So it's likely to change in a second and like HR, exec, or HR professionals and executives, much like Ross, Rachel and Chandler had to do as they went up each step, they had to pivot. And that's what we're gonna have to do. Oops. So as we know, food center events are what are, is really good for morale. It's one of the benefits of being in an office. But as companies, we have to decide where we want to draw the line um, as far as the, the precautions that we want to do that an employer can actually make to still allow people to come in and cook in the kitchen. So much like Kevin cooks in the kitchen in the office, he can still do that, but he's going to have to wear a mask and maybe have a designated server. Maybe you have prepackaged food, or as you can see up in the top, you have an individual who's eating at her desk uh, with a little makeshift cover so she can take her mask off, eat at her desk, and still get the benefits of being around her coworkers. You have to find a safer way to serve and enjoy, but still build that morale. Return to the office is a big thing. Charlotte from Sex in the City had a major setback, this major setback. And then she found inspiration from a Liz Taylor poster that told her it's time for guts and glory. And what we're gonna have to do as HR professionals are asking for volunteers to go back into the office. This is a big step. And you're gonna have people who wanna step up and you're gonna have people who don't. You have to understand the liabilities that what if somebody gets sick at work and you either made it mandatory for people to come back or employees felt pressured. So how you ask for people to return to work is, is going to be a big thing, as well as on the flip side, right? Now you want people to go back to work and people say, no, 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 my now normal is working from home because I love it. And as the last presenter, Scott, uh, last presenter said, we've got 45% of the people saying that they are more productive at work. So maybe we want them to stay there. Speaking of when they do come to work, much like Jesse from Saved by the Bell, where she was super excited to do something. And then in the same breath, she was so scared to do it. So you may have people who volunteer and they come into the office thinking they know what they're going to do and they're super excited about it. And then in the next moment, they're scared and you have to have contingencies for them to change their mind and make quick escapes. I found this bracelet idea on LinkedIn and I just loved it where at a visual moment I can see as we're in the office, if I'm okay with hugs and I'm approaching somebody with a red band, I can quickly say, I can quickly assess and go, hey, I, I need to keep my distance from that person. Think about things, um, hallways, seating arrangements, rotating shifts, these are all going to become, much like this bracelet, the now normal. This one is my favorite, a Festivus for the rest of us. This is an airing of the grievances and we are going to, as people return to work, hear more of this, right? People are going to maybe have more tempers or more outbursts or get even quieter and, and maybe withdraw in. And as HR professionals, we need, and as C-suite, we need to be able to listen. We, be, we need to have pivoting workflows, changing policies and procedures, and those policies and procedures could change on a weekly basis. So a great way to do this is to leverage your HCM system to help people get back to work um, you know, safely, 
how when you change a policy and procedure, push that out and make sure everybody's reading it and understanding it, and possibly even sending out surveys. If you have a good HCM system, they can send a survey out so that you can listen to what people are saying and take their uh, grievances or hopefully their compliments and do something with that. DJ on Full House was having nightmares about a big test that's coming up. And much like that, we are looking at testing. Employees may demand testing. You might ask for testing for your, for your employees. And you have to find the right solution for your organization. What do you do if somebody tests positive? What do you do if somebody's temperature is too high? What are your protocols around that? A big thing is asking and recording medical questions. And even we have a beacon technology that can track as people are walking around the building. You have to be careful, is that a violation of privacy or is it actually safety in the now normal? Have to consider things that are outside of your control. Elevators, Will and Grace were always in an elevator and sometimes they were not in there with people that they knew. You have to think about things like buttons and handrails and again, sitting in an elevator for 20 floors with a whole bunch of people that maybe don't have the same safety precautions that you have set up for your employees. Cleaning and ventilation. Think about hallways and buildings and entryways. How are people going to get into your office? And lastly, bathrooms are a really big deal if you have a shared suite. So how are you going to deal with that? And lastly, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, with her series ending, she ha ended on the empowering note that there's no longer one slayer that's out there. Buffy realizes in that moment that she's not solely responsible for saving the world. And the lesson that we can take from that is that HR may not have all of the answers, but we can certainly leverage our tools use our resources, ask and listen to our employees, make sure that we have care in our forethought and care for our employees, uh, for our employees' well-being, and always be willing to pivot. Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Thank you so much, Monica. Excellent job. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Nita, I'll turn it back to you. And uh, uh, Monica, if you'll switch the, switch the screens back to me, that'd be great. We'll bring Fall up, Paul Falcone up. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for taking us back to some of those wonderful shows of the past. <laughs> As you were speaking, I was reminded that there are elements of psychological safety that are certainly associated with our physical safety. And those are things that we need to think about as HR professionals. Thank you again. Next up, we have Paul Falcone, and he's the CHRO of the Motion Picture and Television Fund in Los Angeles, and he's also a longtime contributor to Sherm's HR Magazine and best-selling author with HarperCollins Leadership, the American Management Association, and the Society for Human Resources Management. Paul is going to present to us how to successfully partner with HR to manage COVID-19 through a case study. Thank you, Paul. Hi, uh, thank you, Dr. Anita. Hi, everybody. Um, Scott, the only thing I'd like a little bit of help with right now is getting my reverse screen up. For some reason, I don't. Let's see. You should. Um, you're, yeah, you're in the right. Lost. You're in the right place. If you just go to your uh, PowerPoint files, and you should see your. Looks yeah. like you, if you I go. up the power, can you see it right now? There we go. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. That thank, you. thank you. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I will keep us on time, I promise. The idea for me is I do HR. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for an organization that is a retirement home, primarily. I've mostly been in entertainment. I was head of HR for Nickelodeon, uh, head of international HR for Paramount Pictures, but I'd also done healthcare and biotech. So this job is kind of a unique fit. And the Motion Picture and Television Fund is a retirement care facility for elderly. If you think about everything you've heard in the news, ground zero for COVID, has been retirement care facilities. And um, Scott, when he talked to me about this, said, Paul, can you talk to us about kind of the regulatory requirements and the approaches that you took? Because I'm sure you were on a special ride 
And I said, I continue to be on a very special ride. And yes, I'd be happy to. So in terms of the compliance piece, everyone, the main thing that I want to talk to you about is um, we know everything has been a moving target. It's been tough because what we hear from the CDC is not what we hear from the federal government. It causes confusion with the employees. In our case, it causes confusion with residents and patients, which you'd expect because they're just not sure what this is and it's the first time we're ever facing these kinds of issues. Um, the second bullet on this slide that was important. The last line talks about requiring exceptional leadership, communication, and team building skills. And what I wanted to focus my presentation on is this idea of keeping things simple and keeping your messaging straight and keeping your leadership teams on the same line. Um, those three things, leadership, communication, and team building, is really what we've determined as a leadership team here at MPTF um, that we need to focus on and everything can build from there. So the point is, no matter what the curveballs that are coming your way, as long as you can kind of keep going back to a simple message and a simple focus, you'll make it work. So one of the challenges we had was what I call stakeholder partnership. Normally, we have four constituencies that we have to care for. First of all, there's our employees, as you'd imagine. And then we have our residents and our patients that are on campus, no surprise. And then there's their families, which is the third element. And of course, there's the greater community. MPTF is, is kind of a, an industry anchor for the whole industry of entertainment. It's not just the retirement home. People think of us as the retirement home. We have social workers that are without, you know, throughout the whole community. There's a lot of things we do in this, in this industry that go beyond um, this, uh, this campus, this 40-acre campus in Calabasas on Mulholland Drive. But the reality is it's broader than that. So we have to always keep that constituency those four key players in our mind. But thanks to COVID, we now have a fifth constituency. And that is, we've always been audited from a compliance and regulatory standpoint from various um, you know, government entities. So for example, for our nursing care side, which is independent, the, um, uh, sorry, having a hard time with this one, the long-term care, which is skilled nursing. We have behavioral health, which is geriatric psychiatry. And then we have the residential folks. Um, we get hit by three different organizations, California Department of Public Health, the Joint Commission, and also Department of Social Services. Well, since COVID began, they have been here, in and out of here so quickly, so aggressively, so much follow-up, so many requirements. Many times what they were asking of us contradicted what the other said, but again, they're independent entities, so we had to follow through with that. The fourth bullet talks about how we did it. So we have a director of infection control and we have a, a medical leadership team, the med staff team. And that's our you know, chief uh, medical officer, chief nursing officer and that whole infrastructure. And what we decided to do was we realized that we've got to make sure that the information we're getting is up to date and what we're giving out to the employees is up to date. And of course, in today's environment, it changes on the dime. So the reality became we created our COVID task force, which is about 30 of us. Um, about 500 employees in this organization, but 30 of us are on this call. And we do every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to noon. It's a lot of information. But what we do is we have to give these updates and who's responsible for what. So you've got materials management giving reports on PPE. You've got HR giving reports on what's going on with the employees versus the union. Um, we've got all the different kinds of things that you'll see in that bottom bullet, whether it's regulatory compliance and reporting and what they're reporting out on the concerns from the employees, what do we do with the quarantining issues when employee tests positive? Do we pay for it? How do we reimburse them? Are we incentivizing people to work in the COVID unit? Um, all of those issues all come together fairly quickly for us. So slide five is probably the most important one. If you think about the big three, which you see in that banner, leadership, communication, and teamwork, the primary driver, keep this as simple as you can, is effective leadership and management, okay? And then we talk about, well, what are those secondary drivers? Clear strategy, transparency, honesty, but there has to be trust. You've heard situations where people have literally walked away from the residential care facilities where they've worked. It's because they felt like they couldn't trust the leadership. Frequent, compassionate communication. You cannot over-communicate at a time like this. Keep that communication coming. The rapid learning, we are all experts in masks. Do you wear an N95 or a KN95? Or do you wear a surgical mask? Or do you wear a cloth face cover? 
we have all become experts in these areas, but we had to make sure we didn't get the training done for the employees. And at all times, we wanted to make sure we created the sense of psychological safety. People were afraid and, and very well, it's, it's understandable that they were afraid. So the point for us, again, is making sure that we were there for everyone. The practical challenges you're going to see will be sweeping regulatory changes. You know, we there's surges that are happening. We're going through that right now in California. Um, the residents uh, fear isolation and loneliness. It's been very hard for them. They can't see their families. There's no communal dining, no communal activities. Um, the employees are afraid about family spread. There's always the question, do you have enough PPE, the, the, the personal protective equipment? So my final slide, or second to final slide, is really focusing on big picture stuff. This is what we talk to all of our division heads about. What are you trying to accomplish, number one? What's it going to take to reach your goal, number two? And what changes can you make towards improvement? And keeping it simple, keeping it focused, and then you can look at each discipline. Nursing had different answers, but nursing can build its plan around that, as could human resources, as could materials management as could our social workers. Everyone had a different role in this, including our regulatory compliance team. So the point I would say is keep it simple, keep it high level, keep it 30,000 foot view, and let everyone find their way of building creative solutions under all of that. The only other thing, Scott, I was gonna say in my slide is I love LinkedIn. Anyone wants to connect on LinkedIn, there's my account. So uh, thanks, Scott, it's a pleasure. Dr. Anita, thank you for allowing me to do the presentation. Thanks as always, Paul, appreciate it. And uh, if you'll turn the controls back over to me and uh, we'll move forward. Uh, and again, thanks, Paul. Thanks for uh, Monica and Victor for really setting the stage for us this morning when we talk about strategy. Um, and while we tee up Dr. Brown for the next series, um, obviously we've been talking about strategy and preparation. Dr. Anita, what are your reactions to these first three speakers? What, do you, what are you seeing and hearing here? I heard a theme from the first two speakers about, um, Victor told us about uh, the new, the now office, excuse me, Monica discussed the for now normal. And then Paul was mentioning a bit about psychological safety and the element of trust. And for those who may not know, psychological safety actually comes with a very nice acronym. The S is for security, A is autonomy, F is fairness, E is esteem, T is trust, and the Y is you the degree to which you need every one of these factors to establish your own psychological safety. And we look at the top three elements that relate to everyone as an individual. And I would say each one of these presenters touched on one of those things in a very uh, succinct way. So absolutely fabulous job. Do we have any questions online about what we've heard so far, Scott? I see we've got a good number of participants with us, over 75. Yeah. Oh yeah. We've, uh, and it's actually more than that. We're, uh, uh, we're, that's our number that's showing on the screen. We're actually approaching total registrations over 300. Thank you. And uh, Fantastic. The, uh, uh, one quick thing, uh, uh, again, for those on that are joining us, the Q&A, uh, feel free to chime in with your questions, and we'll be addressing all questions during the session and at the end with all these speakers, so keep them coming. By the way, we're going to run through the lunch hour, as you know, so pull out your lunch, feel free to eat. Uh, this panelists won't eat, but you're feel free to eat. Uh, we're not gonna be able to see you. So uh, if you're there in your COVID clothes, enjoying yourself watching this, this show, that's great. That's what we want. But uh, do uh, chime in with your Q&A. Dr. Dana Brown, we're gonna turn over to you uh, in, as we get into this next section about inclusive leadership. Dr. Dina Brown is a growth and leadership expert and premier authority in transformational leadership practices that inspires, empowers, and transforms mindsets. She's been working in the areas of organizational change and transformation, executive coaching, and leadership development for the past 20 years. Right now, Dr. Brown is going to mix it up with shaken and stirred social justice, the Molotov cocktail that is blowing up the leadership paradigm. Dr. Brown, blow us away. Well, I am excited um, to be here and to, again, shake things up a little bit. If you haven't already done so, if you've been sitting, just go ahead and like shake your hands, wiggle your body a little bit so that you can be prepared to be stirred. And let me forewarn you that part of this presentation may trigger you, and that's great. Hopefully, it will trigger you to do something, to be different, and to be bolder, and to be better. So I wanted to start with sharing with you that 
One of my most memorable reads is from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. And the line, it is the best of times, it is the worst of times, has always been one of my favorite lines whenever I'm thinking about adversity or, or times that are challenging. Because each time you have something there's a challenge, we should know that there's an opportunity that is there. And this particular book, is symptomatic of, is really sympathetic to the overthrow of the French aristocracy, but highly critical of the reign of terror that followed. And it is the best of times, it is the worst of times, may be the best tagline yet to describe um, 2020. So, just as in A Tale of Two Cities, it uses the French Revolution to explore the themes of sacrifice and rebirth, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, Armand Aubrey and countless others, they serve as symbolic sacrifices that sparked a movement for social justice and an opportunity for corporate social responsibility programs to be reborn with tangible corporate social justice initiatives. The beauty of this is that this revolution is actually being led by our millennials and our generation next. And when we think about those particular leaders, those are the leaders in your organizations that are going to be taking the reins very soon. So it's imperative that you pay attention to what matters to them. And one thing to always note is that our leadership should be a landing strip for our emerging future. So let's talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility. And I wanted to ask, did you know that $20 billion a year is spent on corporate social responsibility activities? 20 billion. And research has shown that those companies that have effective social responsibility programs, they are more than profitable than those that don't. And over the last 50 years, they've relied on these programs to deal with social issues, marketing, philanthropic efforts, and even employee volunteer initiatives and inclusive and diverse work to build their brands. But here's the thing. U.S. companies, they spend around $8 billion on diversity training. And yet these programs designed to increase diversity and inclusion in the workplace, they often fail. And when you think about corporate social responsibility, it's more about the brand. And as we're going to transition and speak to corporate social justice, it's more about humanity. And the Black Lives Matter movement provides an opportunity for leaders to shift past performative allyship into authentic support, diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplaces. And the big problem with performative allyship is that in itself, it doesn't really damage the company, but what it does is provide excuses. And it allows those who are privileged to then decide that, do I really want to make a sacrifice for the systemic issues that they want to claim to address? And that's the beauty of corporate social justice, which is the new hallmark of leadership. So it's not easy and it's not pretty. And one thing that you have to understand is that if you're going to have a corporate social justice initiative, you have to start by looking within your organization because corporate social justice is about reframing CSR and the centers begins to focus away from what I would call superficial programs to kind of show that we're doing a great thing to actually dig in to add value. And it's regulated a lot different because it's regulated inside the company with employees, with your leadership. And it's really about building trust, trust between a company and its employees, its customers, its shareholders, and the broader community. And it explicitly thinks about how am I going to do good by all of them? So who are some social conscious leaders? Well, I will tell you right now, Ben and Jerry's, they get the Hallmark Award. Ben and Jerry's has been a long time advocate for um, social justice. I mean, they share how they should actually fund HR 40, which is funding the research into how slavery impacted black Americans since 1619. And they have gone on not only in their words, but in their deeds. And this has been something that they have done and they have boldly done it. And guess what? Not only have they actually gotten and gained additional community support, but they actually stand by their word and they really set a great example. And we all know that Nike stood by Colin Kaepernick, but Nike has also pledged $40 million over the next 
four years to actually pour into black communities and to help youth in black communities. We have Peloton who donated $500,000 to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And then we had Lego, which I thought was really powerful, who allocated $4 million to, again, go into educating black youth, but also about educating all children and youth about racial equity. That's what socially conscious leadership actually looks like. So the time is always right to do what is right. And when Dr. Martin Luther King said that, I wonder how many of us really can resonate with that. The time is always right to do what is right. So I ask you this question. When you look at your current leadership framework, when you currently look at your policies and procedures, are you actually doing what's right or just saying what should be right? And if you're not, then what are you going to do about it? Because you definitely have to do something instead of just say something. And what I call that something is, I call it the shift factor. It requires a paradigm shift. As you know more, you should do better. And with that paradigm shift in your leadership, you should begin to take conscious actions. That's not only going to help those that you're charged to lead, begin to engage differently, but also begin to change the construct of your organization. And so as you can see, the shift factor is actually an acronym. I love acronyms. And the S is about self-awareness. Get clear about what your mission, vision, and values really are within your organization. But you as a leader also have to decide what does that look like and what does that actually mean for you. And you have to do that work because everything rises and falls on leadership. And if you step out and yet you your audio and your video doesn't match, those you're charged to lead will know that. So that self-awareness is critical. And the H stands for you're going to have to be humble. You don't know what you don't know, and you better get comfortable asking. But ask the right voices, and then be quiet and listen. Yeah, I said it. You actually have to listen as a leader, because leadership is not just about being vocal. It's also about being able to allow and to empower others to be able to share very critical information so that you as a collective team can move the needle forward. And once you're self-aware and you're humble enough to know that you might not have the answers, but you definitely know who actually does, you can then begin to be intentional. What we've seen since the Black Lives Matter movement rocked the world is that we saw a lot of knee-jerk reactions, people throwing empty promises out, people throwing money at things, but not really being intentional about the long game. Because this is not something that's new. Diversity and inclusion is not just a thing. It should be embedded in actually everyday practices. It should be so embedded that you don't have to separate it out. But until it does, you need to be intentional how it does. And when you are intentional, you now can focus. And now there's a focus shift. And this is the part that can be very, very, very uncomfortable. Because you're going to have people who don't want to focus on that particular topic. And they're going to ask you questions as a leader, as an organization. Why isn't that? Why is that important? How does it affect our bottom line? Well, take a look. Take a look at everything that you are doing and whether or not you are truly tapping into all the innovation and the power of those of that team. And the T is the final T is about be tenacious. When it's not easy and when it's when it's very difficult, still stay the course and stay on board. And that shift factor will actually, again, move you to thinking about your brand and to humanity. And so that is my time. I hope that you have a couple nuggets to have you thinking differently about corporate social justice as opposed to corporate social responsibility. Thank you. Dr. Brown, thank you as always. Uh, just terrific, uh, always a terrific show. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And also thank you for your long running support for the Executive Next Practice Institute. Uh, you've just been a tremendous resource and uh, source of inspiration. Thanks again. Uh, so Dr. Anita, I'll, I'll turn it to you as we get ready for Kathy and uh, Louise. Very good. Again, Dr. Brown, as always, excellent job. Thank you so much for reminding us the importance of shifting and in that humility and cultural humility to be more specific. Next up, we have an interview. We've got Louise Keefe, 
the creative solutions driven strategic partner who works with organizations to get at the heart of issues and design sustainable solutions that changes lives and business. And then we have, excuse me for just a moment here, ah, Kathy Medeiros. And uh, she's the vice president of global inclusion and diversity and the executive coach at Eaton, providing leadership and guiding Eaton's global strategy to achieve the company's strategic business objectives and its goal of being a model of inclusion and diversity in its industry. And I just have to give them a shout out here. Uh, Eaton's strategy for creating a culture of inclusion has been supported through the launch of seven employee resource groups with 7,500 members across six global regions. With that, they're going to be sharing with us about leading the inclusion journey how to get started and how to make an impact. Welcome Louise and Kathy. Thank you, Dr. Anita. Uh, so I'm really excited to spend um, the next few minutes with everybody. Um, Kathy uh, was asked uh, back in 2012 to lead the diversity inclusion effort at Eaton. And I was fortunate to be a part of the organization, uh, at least for uh, the first seven years of her journey and see the evidence and really the culture shift in the organization um, over those years to be more inclusive. So I'm ex excited to uh, get to interview Kathy and uh, kind of pick her brain on her journey. Uh, we were thinking that many of you may be trying to lead an effort to help your organization become more inclusive. So I think Kathy's journey will um, give you some tips and ideas of uh, where to begin or where to continue your journey. So with that, Kathy, uh, when you think back to when you were asked to become the uh, VP of Inclusion and Diversity at Eaton, uh, about eight years ago, you know, where did you start? Like, what, where did you begin? And um, how did you really create the strategy to lead the organization in such a powerful way? Oh, thanks, Louise. Yeah, you know, I, I think one might think that intuitively, because I was an HR professional, that I would be able to seamlessly move into this role and and know exactly what to do. And it didn't take me very long to figure out that um, I had absolutely no clue about what I um, was just about to embark. And um, so I, I really started from the standpoint of just reaching out, um, learning as much as I could, uh, reaching out to other organizations in our market space. So we're a heavily industrial company, um, but also reaching out to organizations that are in the consumer products space that have been down this journey, are on this journey for the last 20 years just really trying to understand what has worked for them, uh, what went well, what didn't go well, what are the lessons. And in this uh, time, I met some really awesome CDOs that were out there that were willing to share their, their stories, which was really great. Um, and then I, at the same time, I brought in, a, a at the time, it was a small boutique consulting company that had deep expertise in, in inclusion and diversity and uh, really engaged with them to help me kind of think through where to start and how to frame a strategy. Um, I think really the, the most positive um, thing that we did that really informed us in our strategy is I brought a person on board with me. I had, I had one hire that I could make at the beginning and I brought a, a person on board with me and we actually hit the road and we went around the world and interviewed um, well over a thousand employees in, in our company. And we did it across demographics so that we could really understand the differences across the demographics. Um, and that work, including interviewing one-on-one, -on -one, the entire executive leadership team, that work really informed uh, where the pain points were in the organization, uh, gave us information about the gaps that we needed to think about and help us get more specific about the strategy. Yes, and I remember some of that work. I remember you um, feeding some of that, uh, the, the voice of our employees up to our senior leaders, and some of them were quite surprised, but I think it was eye-opening enough that they got on board with the journey, which was really, really helpful, I think. Yeah, for sure. Now, when you look back on, again, the last eight years, what would you say were the key levers that made the biggest impact um, on the culture at Eaton? Yeah, we, you know, number one is was the unwavering support of our CEO and our executive team, just unwavering from day one. This started in the office of the CEO, um, and he was uh, he stood by this, and 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 I went through a CEO change, and our current CEO does as well. 
Um, and I would say it, that wasn't always easy, right? So it wasn't like I uh, got everything I asked for, but their support was always there, unwavering, and, and uh, they were with me during the good and the bad. Um, the other thing, because of the focus uh, group work we did, we were able to both create a global and a regional strategy that was very helpful to us to stay focused on what mattered to the organization from a global perspective to so the path we were going to all take together, but make it relevant in the regions around the world that uh, we do business. So um, I think having that strategy uh, around both is really important. Um, I would also say that the commitment we made to uh, raising the awareness of our leaders, we invested heavily in some really nice curriculum that uh, brought our leaders together in small groups where they could talk about the business case for inclusion and diversity, um, increase their self-awareness, their emotional intelligence, their cultural awareness, um, and really help them to think through and think more deeply about their own unconscious bias and what may be getting in the way of us being the kind of inclusive company that, that we wanted to be. Um, we put over uh, 6,000 leaders through that course, and, and that course is still alive and, and very effective. And then finally, I would just say, you know, we didn't launch ERG groups right away. Um, we have eight groups, um, so the data was a little bit dated that was dated before we have eight groups today, 11, <clears throat> over 11,000 members. And that's a multiplier effect. So these are employees that have real jobs in the company, but every day they get up thinking about how they can in involve themselves and engage in creating a more inclusive workplace in Eaton. Definitely. And I know you mentioned the curriculum, and I know there are a lot of people, I think um, Dr. Brown even mentioned about, you know, training doesn't necessarily work, but I think that session that was designed, and I was fortunate enough to be one of the facilitators of that, was really opening up the space to have some really powerful dialogue. And uh, I remember hearing multiple times um, some of the participants saying, I never mm -hmm. thought we would have these conversations at work and at Eden. And, you know, yeah. many people moved. I mean, I learned something every time I facilitate one of those sessions because they're really powerful and it really just kind of created that space and the um, kind of the, um, what do I say, the, the opportunity to, to talk about things that may, weren't always easy to talk about. So it really laid the foundation. Um, speaking of that, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you think about the journey um, over the last um, eight years, how has that prepared us for, or prepared the organization for what we've encountered in this, um, this first half of 2020? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, Louise, from a flex work standpoint and, and the adjustment that companies have had to make to work remotely um, and retool their organizations, we had been on this journey for several years and it was one of our flagship inclusion and diversity initiatives to widen our access to the very best talent. And to do that, we knew that we had to be more flexible about how and where work gets done. So we had already deployed a formal flex work program in over 60 of our locations around the world and many others still are, uh, you know, coming on board with that. Um, so it, we already had the technology, the systems, the process, uh, and the culture um, to make it uh, a little easier for us, right, to be able to adjust to this remote work environment. As far as what's most recently going on in our country around the social injustice and the, the horrific uh, things that we're seeing on the news, what I think it did more than anything is it gave our leaders a voice. Um, they didn't run and hide in their offices and pretend like what was going on outside the organization was, was not relevant to them. They were able to have the, the conversations with employees that made a difference and, and still are, are making a difference. And more importantly, it allowed them to really step up and through their empathy and humility, um, get involved in some of the solutions. So really talk about not only what was going on, but what are we collectively as a leadership team going to do about this? And, and how uh, can we continue to support those that were so personally impacted by what's going on around us? Yeah, that's so true. And I think that's when we think about, um, you know, how do we move forward? It is getting that comfort level to kind of lean in and have those conversations. And, you know, I think about, you know, the 
the privilege I had to be a part of the organization during that time, be a part of that. It's helped me to be able to lean in and have conversations that 10 years ago, honestly, I would have been afraid to have. So, um, so I'm very appreciative of it. Um, one last question, Kathy, um, you know, all organizations are focused on um, progress and results. So when you look back, what would you say are the key things that you're most proud of um, in that journey that have made an impact? Well, obviously, the inclusive culture we've been able to create, you know, is stands out for me as number one, but all organizations like hard metrics, right? And when you think about our journey, we started changing the mix because you have to change the mix to change the conversation. And so at the board level, um, you know, back when we started, we had 10% females, we have 33% today. Um, from an ethnic standpoint, we went from 10% to 22%. And then if you look at our global leadership team, when we started, we had uh, about 14% uh, female. Today, that's 17%. And from an ethnicity standpoint, we went from 20 to 50% at our executive team globally. So we're very proud. I've got a lot more data and a lot more metrics we look at, but we're proud of the progress. And we do measure both inclusion and diversity. Awesome. Well, I'd love to spend more time with you, but I think our time is out. So thank you for the time. And I'm um, back to you, Dr. Anita. Thank you. Louisa. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you so much for giving us some glimpses into your journey. I can tell it was arduous, but it was also rewarding. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? Yep. So uh, let's bring up Sue. Sue, if you'll join us and uh, share your screens. And uh, Anita will introduce you. Thank you. My pleasure. Next, we have Sue Patternach, and she is the CEO and founder of Incline Leadership Strategies, a management consulting firm dedicated to the motto, learning transforms people, people transform organizations and societies. She brings 30 years and more uh, track record working with C-suite leaders and their teams to pivot, innovate, or transform their organizations in the face of disruptive volatility. And she's gonna help us in breaking the discomfort about talking about race. Sue. Thank you, Anita. I've been asked to close out the panelist portion of this event to focus on you as individuals, professionally and personally. I will be speaking in generalities, so understanding that everything won't apply to everyone, but let's start here. Most HR leaders I talk to are exhausted. In addition to the many demands from COVID, George Floyd's murder on May 25th has focused executives on the demands of multiple stakeholders who are holding them accountable for racial justice and equity in their businesses. So organizations need to go beyond crisis communication and philanthropic donations to affect meaningful change. So HR executives are depending on HR to be cultural transformational leaders, to elevate racial equity as moral and business priorities by coaching, role modeling, and changing business and leadership practices. So skeptics will say, we've been here before. We've checked the boxes and paid lip service with very mixed results at best. And this frustrates all of us. However, executives are being held accountable by their stakeholders. And there's an opportunity to be more than allies who read and listen, but action-oriented co-conspirators that will make meaningful change. But we can't make that change without breaking the discomfort of talking about race. So we can do this with a growth mindset. So what is this discomfort we have about talking about race? Is it saying or doing the wrong thing? Is it being misunderstood or hurting feelings? Is it triggering anger in those who don't want to let go of their racial bias? Or is it fear of what we might learn about ourselves? So let's use a growth mindset to view this discomfort as an opportunity to learn about ourselves and to communicate about race. So most of us in HR already know this learning and development approach. So which reflects your, your executives, and your employee stage of learning how to communicate about race? Are you unaware, we don't know what we don't know, or aware of what we don't know? Uh, are we capable, meaning we're competent and have basic knowledge but still uncomfortable, or are we experts? Are we highly skilled, well-informed, and emotionally composed? Well, why does it matter to learn how to get past this discomfort? Research shows that when our black colleagues seek help or counseling, lacking self-awareness about our white racial bias makes us more likely to do or say those uncomfortable things. And that discredits us. We're perceived as self-deceptive 
and preoccupied with our image rather than eliminating racism. So this can have long lasting, dangerous mental health outcomes for our black colleagues. So let me introduce you to E.O. Wilson, Harvard sociobiologist who once wrote, we have created a Star Wars civilization with stone age emotions. We live in a microwave and Amazon time, breaking through the discomfort of talking about race can't happen fast enough. And as leaders, we're used to being experts. And if we're not, we're frustrated. But as Brene Brown tells us, if this, is a, this isn't about self-blame or self-shame. This is about vulnerability and courage. And many HR leaders are using their emotional intelligence to make it psychologically safe for our black friends and colleagues to tell their stories. Most tell us this. These conversations are critically important and they're exhausting and they're painful to tell because they're telling us about their experiences with racial hatred. And so what we are doing is we are using various forms of multi-ethnic uh, um, empathy. We are using our cognitive empathy to show that we understand and that we are using our emotional empathy to show that we're, we care and we're kind. What we're struggling with is often with communication empathy in which we have dialogue and we share. So how can we get better at this? So it starts with self-reflection. So how do you feel really about talking about race? So let's, thought, talk about, let's do a quick thought exercise. I'm going to flash two words on the screen. What emotions and thoughts do they trigger for you? So my feelings when I saw these words, resentment. My thoughts, you don't know me. I had to overcome gender and socioeconomic barriers. Well, what is white privilege? It's the advantage white people have based on race, creating racial inequity and injustice. So our, aware, un, our unawareness of our white racial privilege is like a fish in water being under, unaware that they're wet. So upon reflection, I wasn't aware of my white privilege and this was humbling and sobering. So what caused this? Over the centuries, Europe was always diverse. Different ethnicities, languages, religions led to brutal wars over borders, power and resources that dehumanized others to justify domination. And once Europeans came to America, skin color became the primary way to dehumanize others to justify domination. Why? Because white skin was all they knew. So whiteness was normalized and everyone else was racialized. So some of those Europeans became the white Americans that enslaved and then segregated black Africans. But segregation was outlawed in 1964. How relevant is this today? Didn't that end racism and discrimination? Well, as we know, we've seen many, many improvements over the decades, but we have also a far way to go. There's been some stagnation. So you probably heard of structural racism. And in HR, many of us know of the experiment of sending four identical resumes adjusted for gender and race, showing greater frequency of interviews and hires going to white males. Other research shows that when black candidates whiten their resumes, their odds of getting interviewed and hired increase significantly. This is an example of structural racism. It's those policies and practices and cultural norms that legitimize racial inequity at the institutional level. Well, let's talk about the societal level. At the societal level, this is at the community or the group level. So if you're not black, imagine living a life in which you're suspected of being less intelligent or having a criminal intent because of your skin color. Several black colleagues have said how they've had to go along to get along because they didn't feel free to speak up. And any woman who has felt the sting of being labeled a gender hire can empathize with the insult of being labeled a diversity hire. And at the individual level, though the media covers extreme examples of racism, there's less focus on the awkward everyday interpersonal interactions caused by unconscious racial bias. This Stephen Colbert comedy bit mocked white people who show off their one black friend. Others with racial bias who experience discomfort with black people unconsciously express this with 
increase eye blinking, avoiding eye contact, indirect body posture, and quicker, more transactional interactions. So I invite you to focus on yourself, even if you are an expert. We're all works of progress and learning. And as you coach and lead change, you'll be the role model of cognitive, emotional, and communication empathy. So here is a communication empathy exercise from the EIDI Institute, which you can use for yourself when coaching or facilitating a small group discussion. So as you scan these, consider this. The more we share our feelings, our beliefs, and our experiences about race, the more we can break the discomfort of talking about race and drive meaningful chains for racial justice and equity in our organizations and in this country. That's my time. Thank you. Thank you. So terrific job. Thank you as always for joining us and again for supporting the organization over the many years. Thanks again. Yeah. Well, I'll turn it to you, Dr. Anita, for our final uh, group of uh, experts. What a power, power, powerful, powerful session we just had. The running theme I picked up from Dr. Dina, Louise, and Kathy to Sue is that work is required when we talk about DEI. And particularly as leaders, we need to first practice self leadership and be willing to look at some hard areas that's going to be crucial to us moving forward as a society and especially as an HR organization. So, our last two speakers. Wow, I can't believe it's almost up. This has been so good. Our last two speakers, Hari Aburi is the managing partner of the preparation company, and his focus is on agility for strategy, leaders, organizations, and HR. And he's going to be talking to us about the need to reset and reinvent. Hari. Uh, thank you very much, Anita, Scott. Uh, what a pleasure it has been listening to people. Uh, very powerful thoughts, and very, it's a time for reflection in a sense. And uh, I want to focus the next uh, five to seven, eight minutes on really at a much higher level of why are we really needing to talk about reimagination and, and resetting ourselves. Uh, I believe that leaders who are unimaginative uh, are the greatest threat to the future of a company. And over and over again, this has been proven because every time we have either a problem or a missed opportunity, it is because we have been so tethered to the past that we have been unable to imagine a future that is so brilliant. So I, am a, I lead a very niche firm on agility. It's called the Preparation Company. And uh, I'm, I'm part of the Forbes uh, HR Council, uh, Los Angeles Business Journal Leadership Trust. And I also teach at Caltech a strategy course. And, and I invite you on this journey to think through what, what does it mean to be at the intersection of imagination and reset mean. We live in weird times, you know, so we live in difficult times, we live in socially challenging times, but from a business standpoint, we also live in a time of massive transition. And, and nothing summarizes it better than the fact that this tweet says that it, there was a point of time, I think in March or April, where the crude oil barrel was $5 and cheaper than my Netflix connection. So we see a world at the intersection of intangible assets, and intangible asset thinking and physical asset thinking. You know, you know, the fact that Netflix could be more valuable than ExxonMobil was unthinkable even 12 months ago. So where are we in HR? So we are at the intersection of business and employees. We are constantly trying to see how a business manages a workforce. So what it does is it forces us to think policy, framework, rigid structures, and all of that, quite honestly, is backed up by fairly outdated HR education. If you Google HR courses that we are teaching across the world, you wouldn't find anything on innovation. You wouldn't find any course really talking about the link between innovation and DNI, uh, and and really the future of business. So, so we are stuck with a very outdated HR education that continues to drive the rigidity and compliance-based people strategies. As compared to where. HR people strategy should be actually. So it should be at the intersection of customers and business models, not businesses and employees. And there's a key reason why I say that. Customers reflect the society. Business models reflect purpose. When our purpose aligns with the society that we serve, we have far greater alignment of values, principles, culture, ethnicity, societies, uh, religions, etc. And we do a far better job of inventing and reimagining business models. So an agile people strategy, according to me, really focuses on how we can reinvent ourselves to serve our customers who actually represent the society that we live in. 
And then comes, so what does that mean uh, to be agile in terms of people's strategy? How can we rethink our results uh, uh, in terms of how we are running our organizations? You need to be at the intersection of transaction platforms and innovation platforms. Transaction platforms could be LinkedIn, for example, that we're all familiar with, WeChat. Uh, it could be PayPal, uh, where you do a transaction and you're done with it. Or it could be an innovation platform like Apple iOS software, where developers build apps on it or or IBM Watson, et cetera. To be at the intersection is really to imagine HR to move away from very transactional, process-oriented, restrictive compliance thinking, and to be at the heart of innovation in a company. If your HR function and if your HR team is not known to be the best ideators in the business, you know you have a problem. So your talent strategy has to be across industries. You need people from all segments of capabilities and expertise areas. You need to know how to do the handshake between humans and technology and, and poorly done handshakes result in, in, in significant social impact. And you also need to mirror the strategies that you apply for your customers that to your employees. And there are so many examples around. So some of the best teams that are managing today, some of the futuristic organizations are playing at the intersection of transaction and innovation platforms. They're like hybrid HR models. In my work, when I work with companies, we do a diagnostic where it's called Agile People Strategy Diagnostic and Design. What we found was 70% of agility is not structure related. It doesn't matter if you're a large team, small team, cross-functional team, or any other team, but it does matter how you work. You can change the structure, but if you don't change the methods, the processes, the way decisions are made, uh, the how part of it, you will still be very, very rigid as a company. We found 90% of frameworks in HR are fairly outdated, including performance management. You know? So the value of the job was still activity-based, not outcome-based. And across organizations, um, almost quite a few of them actually, we saw a 40% simplification in HR itself. HR has now become a fairly complex entity by itself uh, where people struggle to understand what the value is and how they're communicating with the rest of the, with the, rest of the employees and outside uh, stakeholders. And obviously most of the talent is single industry that's causing them to be fairly uh, outdated. Uh, they quickly become irrelevant to the marketplace. So in, in, a, in a short sense, uh, for us to reimagine our world, to reset it, we need to really rethink on how we focus on it and where, at what intersection are you playing? Are you playing at the intersection of business and employees or are you playing at the intersection of customer and businesses? Therefore, you can actually question everything and reinvent every single piece in your organization Anything that touches an employee is a HR issue. It doesn't matter if you have a pure, very poor interface on the customer service side, or if you have a poor interface between shared services and employees, you still have to have that imagination to reinvent it and feel and make people really feel saying, wow, you know, this was never done before. Um, so I invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn. If, if you want to hear more about the diagnostic, do write into us. Uh, if you love this, do like and follow me on LinkedIn. I will put this presentation up shortly on LinkedIn as well. Uh, with that, uh, back to you, Scott, Anita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great job. So um, we move into our, our final speaker, and uh, she has come to us. Victoria has come to us through our friend Ewing Gillespie, who spoke at our New York conference uh, and some others in the past. Yes, we're delighted to have you join us, Victoria. And uh, Nita, I'll turn it over to you to make the introduction. Thank you, Scott. Victoria Peltier is the Vice President of IBM's North American Talent and Transformation Practice. She's also a published author, in-demand public speaker, and appears regularly on national TV. And she is going to share with us the journey to workforce resiliency. Victoria, welcome. Great, thank you, glad to be here. Of course, as I'm about to get on, I see things starting to uh, to slow down um, tremendously. If it does that, I'll come off video and see if that, if that helps at all. Uh, let me just go here. And is everyone able to see my screen? Not yet. Should... Amazing. And apologies that this is uh, taking a moment here. Let me see if, sure. 
Scott, do you have my presentation? It seems to be a hard time pulling it up. Oh, yeah. here we go. No, I've... Uh, there we go. Let me try that one more time. Share. There we go. <laughs> Are we good? Fantastic. You can see it now? <laughs> yes, great, great job. Looks great. Okay. So um, thank you so much for being here. I, uh, I lead at IBM our North American Talent and Transformation uh, Business Unit. And what that is, is everything related. It's an externally facing view. I'm not an internal practitioner. I lead our consulting, advisory, tech, and services space for all things related to people. I've been really fortunate over these last couple of months uh, to spend time with, and I don't think I'd be exaggerating because I host a number of CHRO roundtables, uh, close to 300 conversations with HR executives like yourselves, as well as other task forces, uh, to look at what the return to work, and quite frankly, the vernacular needs to change to work, be returned to the workplace, because I'm sure we have all never worked harder than we are right now. So what we've seen in this journey towards resiliency is obviously that we were in this crisis stage a number of months ago, and there's been this sort of, I say now, I should, you know, that really just over the last, you know, 30, 45 days, this component in the middle and moving into the far right around what the physical reentry looks like. That may include a number of things related to not only the facilities, the PPE, and the things that we heard from, you know, an earlier speaker about. I've actually been double hatting and um, been the leader for North America around contact tracing. So spending time with lots of U.S. state, local governments, health agencies, in large part because it's actually about the people, the trust, the transparency in hiring contact tracers to do this, ensuring that they look feel sound like everyone within their, their home state or local counties. So I've been very, very engaged in what that looks like. But quite frankly, even in um, the conversations I was having in sort of the last quarterly CHRO roundtable I hosted, there was a shift towards what we're talking, we see on the right-hand side and talking about this dynamic enterprise. How do we prepare for not only a resurgence that we're seeing certainly in many states around the US right now, but quite frankly, just preparing our organizations for resilience period for whatever we might face in the unknown going forward. This on a page is actually what the IBM journey has looked like, both in terms of IBM for IBM, as well as IBM in terms of how we continue to support and deliver for our clients. And now in terms of with my team and the conversations I have with HR and executive leaders around how do we move forward, right? Again, obviously being a global organization, we saw this much earlier in, in, uh, with our colleagues and, and offices in Asia preparing that to get to, and quite frankly, we had our team, 99% of our staff and home offices within 10 days. That remaining 1% were either essential workers in data centers or other places where we needed them to physically remain, or um, some clients that wouldn't allow um, our colleagues to work from home, such as some of the financial services um, institutions from a PII and other perspective. What we've seen, of course, is you know that obviously our role, not only from an HR standpoint, but the leadership, you know, is very much uh, you know around how do we adapt to this digital area. Now we were all doing this for quite some time. You know, again, we heard Victor earlier talk a lot about the digital transformation, but you know, many of the companies that we found and our clients were supporting were not prepared to really adapt to what this looked like. Right you now, there's an expectation that we all have as, as employees that we can have this consumer grade experience, right? So the ability to go onto the Amazons in order and everything we needed in that kind of an environment. So our role in creating that has changed dramatically, you know, around having these experiences, looking at the skills in terms of how to manage, you know, in a go forward environment, working in, you know, with new collaboration tools, right? Now it's, I'll slack you later, right? Versus email or others as be becoming the preferred method. Let me move here. So our role is much more strategic than it's ever been, 
right? And doing so not only in terms of the preparedness and many of these, what I'm seeing are these task forces in terms of, you know, returning to the new normal, the abnormal, the for now normal that we heard, you know, earlier, you know, it's these task forces are working across the organization. You know, the preparedness means working with the business unit functional leaders on, you know, what does not only these next number of months or even into 2021 going to look like in terms of rolling re-entries and how and where the work's getting done, but really the transformation more aggressively moving forward. So how do we prepare? How do we personalize the experience? Right. I, it, it's interesting to see. We actually um, surveyed did a, a survey a number of our clients, and I'll share one from a client I've spoke to around hers study, but that, you know, 50 percent, you know, of employees are talking a lot about how this is the most stressful time, you know, in their career. You know, yet one, how do we respond in terms of, you know, preparing to that personal experience for those in terms of EAP and other programs? But also, interestingly, this one CHRO I was talking to did the same in terms of surveying their staff, had a very you know, high response rate, more than statistically significant with over 7,000 employees responded, who said they had a 97% um, respo uh, response rate back in terms of trust of their leadership. Yet only 44% of them were confident in the ability for them to return and work in whatever the new normal was gonna be because it was so unknown. So they shifted to things to become more personal around doing weekly, you know, um, webinars and podcasts and things like that. Not saying that that's going to, including our CEO, by the way, not saying that's going to continue going forward. But again, how do we, you know, respond and adapt during these times? Where I'm actually seeing the conversation shift even more so now is you know, around how we're supporting our employees and for, for us at IBM, you know, our clients around this digital transformation. I'm interestingly, I've, I said earlier, I've never worked harder. You know, I, ha I had to for my, my US green card, a few of you might catch an accent, I'm actually originally Canadian, um, had to provide extremely detailed information. And I recently went back around, you know, the work I do and how I spend my time. And it was interesting, I went back and actually looked at our own time logging system of, you know, to see how much time I've spent over the last number of months. And it's a, an average of a 70 hour work week. Um, so talking about never working harder, I expected a bit more of a slowdown in terms of, again, I'm client facing, supporting people like yourselves. I expected we slowed down as things sort of shifted to the right, but there's been this incredible acceleration on a couple of fronts. One, the need to digitally transform businesses. I mean, those are my colleagues, you know, in our, in our digital strategy and mobile app development, um, you know, groups that are working hard, but again, the change that comes for the, for, for the colleagues, right? So how do we look at this, the skills? But again, the way that the work gets done by whom it gets done is causing this need to look at what we see this build for the future right now, right? And also the, the need for structural cost transformation. I'm sure many of you have been given cost takeout targets, not only within the HR functional area, but in support of other um, areas within the business. So looking at how to do that, right? Are you to, to upskill for people? Are you buying the talent? Are you borrowing it? You know, are you looking at bots and automation driving forward? So we're working through this exercise of understanding what people have really aligning with the line of business executives to understand the strategic plan that they had for three to five years out and how that's changed given the current environment, you know, that we're sitting in now and how do we ex need to accelerate that from a talent perspective and continuing to factor in what you see on the right and particularly the ongoing disruption factors. So if you're not already having this conversation internally with your business um, line leaders, I'm sure you will be. So again, building a resilient workforce to adapt to all the things we're doing right now, but also doing so in parallel with where things are moving to build much more towards the future, the resilient workforce. So with that, let me hand it back over. Victoria, thank you again. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just a terrific overview. Uh, great way to uh, close out this session in terms of uh, how IBM is moving forward strategically. So for the audience, uh, give us just a couple of extra minutes as we move on here. I do wanna to get to your questions uh, and uh, 
uh, have Dr. Anita comment on the overall content from today. Uh, I just want to go back just a couple of quick questions. Uh, one of them was around, um, this is to all the panelists, by the way, how do you measure the success of organizational HR programs, uh, specifically DNI or and or innovation? So it's the measurement question. Uh, Dr. Dina, can you, uh, I know you've typed a, a, an answer in here, but can you address the, uh, uh, the uh, measurement perspective? And I think you're still on mute, there we go. And let me unmute, yeah. So this is a great question. And one thing that I actually put into the chat is that looking at measurement, you actually have to measure something. Mm -hmm. And so one way to do that is when you look at what you have now this year, insert any particular identity group that you're looking at for diversity and inclusive voices, and then see, has there been a shift and change the next year? That will give you actually a tangible number. And then if you're not seeing an increase, which is that might be your goal, then why? So you have to kind of get to the reason why it's not there, not just say, oh, we couldn't find anyone. So did you make sure that the conditions that are inside of the organization are there to actually encourage an increase in that specific place? Or are the conditions inside the organization there to limit those voices? And so you have to actually use whatever measurement tool, and that's the numbers and looking at the data that you have in your organization. And if you don't have it, then implement it and put it there. So that's how you can begin to deal with the measurement um, aspect of that. And don't forget to ask why not, not just that we don't have them, why not? And so then it takes a deeper dive and you may have to actually do an audit, an organizational audit and look at all of your internal practices and lead, look at your leadership dynamics because again, everything rises and falls on leadership and does the audio and video match? And is it creating that psychological safety that you actually heard today? And are you actually taking an active role and doing so to make sure that people will begin to engage or that you can hire, that you are having more inclusive practices. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Brown. And uh, Kathy, we had a couple of questions of similar nature to you about your specific uh, experiences with Eaton in terms of leading diversity and inclusion teams and how you measured it and what kind of results did you get? Yeah, sure. And we, um, you know, we measure, as I said, both inclusion and diversity. And we had an opportunity with the revamp of our entire engagement survey to really um, beef up our the inclusion piece of that. So we now have what we call our engagement inclusion index. And it really gives us a good sense of whether or not our employees have a, a sense of belonging, um, whether or not they feel that their uniqueness is valued, and there's several other factors there that we look at. But it gives us an opportunity um, to not only look at engagement, to, but to also look at inclusion. And then, of course, diversity. We measure women globally. Um, we have about 100,000 employees around the world. We measure globally, but we measure um, minority status and ethnicity in the U.S., right, only. So that's a U.S.-based number. Um, and then in terms of teams, you know, we, we really try to make sure that um, we have tools that we've created for leaders um, for things as simple as leading a team meeting, making sure that there's an inclusive environment in the room. Is everybody's voice being heard? Is the leader noticing who's not speaking and, and maybe who needs an opportunity to speak up on a topic? So we've got a little toolkit that they can use to um, conduct meetings and team events and make sure that there's a lens of inclusion on those activities. That's terrific. Very, very specific. And uh, thank you again for your uh, contributions today and then joining us. Um, Dr. Anita, uh, we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, and all of it is very specific uh, from strategy to preparation to COVID-19 to DNI. Uh, what, what are your reactions? How will you summarize some of this? Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge and congratulate all of our speakers. This was not an easy task. You all did a phenomenal job sharing all of your wisdom and information experiences in such a short amount of time. So thank you very much for that. When I go back and look at my notes and I was writing feverishly, um, what I noticed is the fact that we've taken time to reflect and reprioritize and redefine life in general. And a lot of that is dependent on our resiliency, just how resilient we are. 
And some days resiliency just means getting up and going forward. Um, occasionally I see that little clip on LinkedIn that says it's okay not to be okay. And when we think about the now office, the for now normal, uh, balancing psychological safety and physical safety, and the need to lean into the humility so that we can shift into the DE&I journey personally and professionally, uh, that requires resiliency. But I'm also hopeful because of the rich conversation that we've had here today. I know that those that have been listening, they're ready and they're sparked and they're ready to set their organizations on fire based on the wonderful information that you've shared. Again, fabulous job, outstanding information. Uh, we had a good crowd and some good um, interaction in the chat and the Q&A. So, Scott, I'm just going to go ahead and, and leave it over to you. And again, thank you for the opportunity to serve. Thank and thanks again, Dr. Anita, and I want to echo your comments. These speakers did an outstanding job, all of them, in a short period of time. Just a note to the audience, that this event's been put together for some time, but we added a couple of speakers because we felt the content was so good. Uh, we're going to look forward to seeing you at this reInvent Summit again, emanating out of San Diego in just a couple of months. Uh, and we encourage you to keep in touch with us. You will receive a follow-up email from today with contact information for all of our speakers and our sponsors, and we'll please um, follow up with them, get connected with them, continue this conversation. Again, for all of you, uh, we could go on all day. This is just tremendous information. And we really appreciate your time, effort, and passion around these topics, and we're gonna look forward to seeing you again really, really soon. As I close out, I'm going to throw up the screen in terms of how you can connect with us, and we'll see you at our upcoming events uh, over the next coming weeks. Don't forget that our Innovation Summit is August 27th, and the Pyra Conference is coming up very close after that. Thanks again to everyone, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>